Vamos a ver si David logra ingresar. Hola, hola. ¿Cómo estás? Bien, ¿cómo estás? Estoy bien, man. Good. English o Spanish? <laughs> man, whichever one you want. I'm good with this one. Are you that fluent in uh, Spanish? Yeah, I uh, I mean, it's not perfect, but... Pero sí, sí hablo. Um, de hecho, yo viví en, en México un ratito. Uh, y mi iglesia es bilingüe. Aquí en Dallas es bilingüe. Oh. Entonces, así aprendí. <laughs> nice, man, nice. So, how you been, David? I'm good. Doing good. Just yeah. uh, staying busy with work and everything. You know oh. how How about you? I'm good, man. You know, it's uh, work. Uh, trying to remodel the house a little bit. Cool. Trying to create some extra space for me, for music. That's good. Yeah, I've been seeing some of the things that you've been posting. I know you've been doing a lot of stuff uh, with guitar. So it sounds really good. Thanks, man. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, like, is that all you do for uh, for a living, music? What? Actually, no. Um, so I used to do a lot more music than I have done in the, the most recent years. So used to, I um, my main source of income was teaching. I oh. taught guitar for many, many years, had a lot of students. And then... Um, But, um, and then I would play I, and travel, and I used to do a lot of recording and stuff. Um, and then uh, the last several years, I've really just been focused on um, my wife and I have a cleaning business. Oh. Uh, we, we went to the mission field. We moved to Mexico in 2015, and uh, we helped start a church down there. That was a sister church of our church in Dallas. Uh, and uh, so we kind of like let everything go um, at that time. And then when we came back, we were starting from zero. And so we ended up starting a cleaning business, which I never thought I would be doing a cleaning business. So, uh, so we clean houses. I pretty much just manage the business now. Um, we have several employees. And um, so... That's been a really interesting experience, you know, uh, for us. And, and it's, it's interesting how the Lord, you know, directs you in different ways. And sometimes he'll use uh, different things in your life at different times to teach you, you know, something that, uh, that he wants to show you. And so, so anyway, uh, so the last several years, I've been kind of um, not quite as active with music. I wow. still lead worship at my church some, and I play guitar at my church, um, you know, and, and we'll do little things here and there. Um, I do some recording at home, and then um, lately I'm, I've been very excited because our church is, uh, the Lord's been giving everybody a lot of new songs, so we're actually working on an album right now, um, and so we're in the process of uh, recording demos, We've got mm -hmm. several demos recorded, and then we have a single that's basically finished that we'll be releasing hopefully uh, in November. Um, so, and it's all Spanish. Right now, everything's in Spanish. So, nice. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, that's uh, that's that's part of what you do for a living. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like you're busy all the time, man. Oh uh, yeah, this owning your own business keeps you very busy. Uh, so, sure. now what do you do for a living? Well, I'm actually in college uh, full time for nursing. Oh but wow! I'm break right now, so I'm working at this place uh, called Zoos, and what we do is uh, medical grade tubing. Oh wow! Yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty technical. It's not your uh, you know you press a button and you know the machine runs itself. It's a little bit more technical than you would expect it to be. Yeah. I actually to be in training for like. For like six months before they actually let me be on my own uh-huh yeah and um i've been playing at my church also for 21 years now i was actually the first musician at that church yeah yeah it's uh it's been fun you know 
when I first started in this music thing, I was like 15, I think. Uh-huh. And uh, I had an old acoustic and I used to play, my mother used to sing. We moved from New York to South Carolina. Okay. So it was a very dramatic change for, for me as a teenager, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. How did you um, h- how did you develop into like the the style of guitar playing that you have now with the rock and learning you know more melodic solos and things like that? Yeah. Well, uh, when I was learning, um, I remember my uncle, who is the pastor of our church now, he bought me this book from uh, Marcos Wheat. You know Marcos Wheat, right? Yeah. And uh, it was an old album called uh, Poderoso. Hey, and big music. All I could understand was, you know, E minor, A major. So yeah. I started doing because it actually had the guitar charts there. <laughs> so okay. I, yeah. So I, that was probably the first album that I actually got into, you know, deeply. But then after the after that, I got corrupted a little bit by this uh, country guy that I, I met, and he was our neighbor. And he was very much into like uh, Eric Clapton, uh-huh. you know, old, uh, classic rock songs. Yeah. And he loved Stratocasters. Uh-huh. Uh huh. He taught me a few times. He took me over to his rehearsals a few times also. It cool. was a very uh, nice experience for me also. Cool. Yeah. And uh, what about you, David? Uh, how did you get into this music thing and when did you start? Because <laughs> yeah. I, I got to tell you, man. Your, your your album with Marco Barrientos, that was that's one epic album, man. <laughs> you got all long epic souls there. How yeah. did, how did you meet him? I mean, how did it all happen? Yeah. So, um, man, uh, playing with Marco it has was always very very special um, because you know Marco is all about the moment and. Yeah and really going after the spirit and, you know, whatever God's doing in the moment. And so, um, so that's why we ended up with all those super long solos, you know, and uh, after that night, actually, after that recording, Marco, Marco told the band, he said, um, he said, you know, I've recorded many times, but this is the first time I've ever actually forgotten that we were recording, you know, because he was so into the moment, you know, and And you you feel it when you listen to the album. Yeah, yeah. Marco's such an awesome guy, such a, a worshiper. But uh, how we got connected, so I went to school at Christ for the Nations in Dallas, and I was part of the English school. Well, Marco um, basically headquartered his ministry out of CFNI, out of Christ for the Nations, and he was very involved in the Spanish school also, but he would sometimes lead worship in the English chapels. Um, and, um, and so I was part of the worship team just in the mornings for chapel. So he would come in and be with us. And man, I always just like loved being with him. I was like, I don't know who this guy is, but he's so like special because he just really has a very humble heart and um, just, you know, really going after the Lord. And so I always loved worshiping with him uh, in, in chapels. So then, um, I guess at the time, his music producer was uh, Julian Collazos, and oh, he, yeah, yeah. we kind of knew each other a little bit through school. Um, so I had, again, played with Marco during chapel, and they asked me to, um, actually, I think the first time we ever played together was in, well, as part of Marco's band, was in Peru. And uh, I happened to travel to Peru with him and another guy also from CFNI uh, who plays keyboards. And we did um, like a little tour there uh, in a conference. And so um, then after that, we got more connected. And I I traveled with Marco for about a year. um, And then we ended up recording Cre kind of at the end of that year. And then um, we also, I also did one of the studio albums with him, the... um, I can't remember what the series is called, but it's it's Yo Soy Tu Luz. You know, he was he would do like Yo Soy Tu Padre, Yo Soy Tu Sanador, oh. and and so we did that one too. That was a studio album, right? What's that? Was that a studio album? That was yeah. Not- all those are are studio. They're like live in the studio kind of. 
And that was you playing in that uh, album. Yeah, I'm Joy Soy to lose. Joy Soy to lose. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so, so that's how we got connected, and um, and then uh, shortly after that, you know, I just kind of like uh, we, you know, changed paths and stuff. So we haven't really done anything together for a while, but um, but I love Marco. He's he's an awesome guy. So thankfully, I still run into um, uh, Ivan Munoz. You know, she sings with him. And sometimes she comes and ministers at our church and okay. di different things because we're both in Dallas. Um, she's a really great friend as well. So, she has a great voice, man. <laughs> yeah. I she's think I've uh, listened to her singing since 1999, and I've yeah. always uh, enjoyed her singing. Yeah. She's an awesome lady. She's very powerful in the yeah. world. So. And how did you get started in music? How old were you when you first started, you know, uh, learning yeah. guitar? Yeah, so I actually started playing bass guitar when I was about 11. Um, I took lessons and uh, did that for about six months. Then I got more serious about guitar when I was 12. Um, and I started playing at my church when I was, I think, 12 years old, 12 or 13. And oh. I didn't think I was saved yet. <laughs> <laughs> But, like, I started going to this new church, and, and the youth pastor uh, really wanted to get me involved. I was, I was very lost, and uh, I was just a kid, but I, was, I had been into a lot of bad stuff, and um, God really started drawing me uh, through his love, through the people there, and then also through his presence. And I had never really experienced the presence of God in worship. Um, and I, and I, my heart was really hardened um, in a lot of ways. But when I went to that church and saw the love in, in the people and started feeling God's presence, I was just like, oh, my gosh, you know, I don't want this to end. Every time we would do worship, you know, I'd just be like, oh, my word, you know, why are we stopping? Yeah. Uh, which that still happens today. <laughs> but, but um so, so anyways, I got involved with the, the worship team at our youth group, and um, that's how I learned to play, and I was terrible, absolutely terrible in the beginning, <laughs> and I, I grew up playing, like, Metallica, and, Guns oh. and, 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 like, I didn't really know what I was doing, you know, and so I had to learn chords, and my youth pastor would show me stuff, and, and then I just um, would spend hours and hours in my bedroom just trying to figure out the scales, and how it all worked, how it all went together, and then you know, the Lord, I think, would just, you know, teach me things, help me along the way. And um, we learned so much. Um, as a band, but um, it was a really special time, you know, growing up, like in, high, in my high school years. And that's where uh, I learned a lot. And then at CFNI, I had an, we had an awesome, awesome band leader. And it was kind of like, I always tell people, it was like, um, it was like musical boot camp. Like we, it was hardcore. I've never had anybody uh, like that before, uh, but they put us through musical boot camp. And that's actually where uh, Keith Banks came from. Oh. Me, and Noyola. Um, and I'm trying to think who else. There were like several people that came out of that time that ended up being professional musicians and and that are involved in a lot of different things now so it was a it was a really special time uh but that's that's kind of how i how i grew up i mean just kind of learning you know little things here and there uh, over the years cool man um so just to be clear cf9 is a music school for uh, uh christians or so it's Christ for the Nations Institute. It's in Dallas. And it's actually just a Bible school. So it's kind of a practical theology school. Um, it's not like a university like Oral Roberts or yeah. some of those other ones. Um, it's a little bit more practical ministry and theology. And then they have, but they've always been very strong in worship. Music is kind of part of the DNA at that school. Oh, okay. um, but they had a very strong music program, um, and so uh, we, you know, we have a couple different chapel bands. They do live recordings every year, live worship recordings. Um, they have a really nice studio there, 
And uh, so actually, Creto es Posible was recorded in the auditorium at Christ for the Nations. Oh, okay. okay. So that's, that's the auditorium. It looks a little bit more, it looks a little different now, but, um, but yeah. So, and uh, that, I also taught guitar there for several years. So um, that was kind of like my home base for a long time. Okay. That's cool, man. Yeah. And um, about that album, so uh, that was not your first time playing with Marco Barrientos, right? You at, you said you played with him in, in chapel before? Yeah, yeah. I played with him in chapel some, and then we traveled. I think I traveled with them as a fill-in for about a year. So, um, you know, we, we did several dates together where we would go to different cities in the U.S., and we went to Peru uh, once, and then um, then we worked up to, to doing Cre, and... Um, it was a really fun album, actually. The songs are really special. Um, Julian, I think, wrote most of the songs on that album, and there it was. It was really cool. We had a lot of fun. We we kind of, uh, you know, when we talked about when we talked about the album, we just decided we wanted to try to do some kind of different sounds, yeah. different arrangements than typical and so um Julian was doing some interesting sounds i had a lot of fun with the guitar parts um we just tried to kind of think out of the box and and um and and get creative it was a lot of fun actually i really really enjoyed uh writing the guitar parts on the album it's a long album isn't it <laughs> yeah. yeah there was a lot of songs to learn yeah it might be probably one of his uh longest albums because uh yeah. I think some of those uh, songs are like close to six minutes each, probably more. Yeah, I think some of them go on for 11 or 11 minutes. Or, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I had to uh, do this live thing with you because I, I tell you, man, my wife, she, she's been all about that album since she heard it in 2008, 2009. And I yeah. was like, oh, who he is, honey? He's like, I try to look him up because there's a part in that album where I think you're about to play a solo and Marco says, Jaime. I'm like, who is Jaime? You know, <laughs> is that your name? No, no. Uh, I Somebody commented about that on Facebook recently. I can't remember what <laughs> it said, but he he used to say like, vamos David or vamos da David. Maybe that sounds like Jaime because he'll say David. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't know. <laughs> I was, when I finally found who you were, and I looked at your name, David J. Elam, I was like, well, maybe his second name is Hi James, right? And he called him Hi Spanish. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. yeah. It's actually Josiah. But yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think he said Jaime. I, I don't know. All right. We, we like figured that out a couple weeks ago, but I don't remember. <laughs> He always did that to you when uh, when it was time for you to play a uh, solo. He'll shout out your name. Yeah, yeah, he would do that a lot. I have another friend that does that, and um, yeah, I'll say "Vamos, David," or or yeah, <laughs> you know, David, you know, play the guitar or whatever. So, <laughs> it's just a uh, you know th that's his style, you know. To First leave. time I actually searched you on Facebook and Instagram under Jaime or James. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Um, about that album, David, um, there is a song. Uh, I don't know exactly what the name of it is, but you play a solo there that kind of sounds like you're using a fuzz pedal with an octave sound. Yeah. Kind of like a 60s, 70s, you know, Hendrix type sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean to do that? Yeah. So I had... Back then, I don't have it anymore, but I had an amplifier. It was called an Ampeg Jet 2. And it's actually a 1960s reissue. Oh, okay. Um, and it was a 15-watt amp, and it had the EL84 tubes. So it has kind of that British sound from oh. like 60s or 70s. And so what I did was I turned the drive all the way up. Actually, so it's a, it was a one-channel amp, and it just had one knob. It was volume and drive. Like for the same, just one knob. So I turned it all the way up, and uh, and that's where you get that fuzz sound. So um, so I I used two amps on that album. I used that one, and then I used a Fender Twin Reverb, 
uh, for like the cleans and then I had some, my pedals, but sometimes I, I turned the distortion up all the way on that amp and um, it was fun. Yeah, yeah, I was like, wow, this uh, this guy really knows his style. <laughs> I mean, that's that solo, I mean, it was kind of, you know, uh, a, a short one, one of the shorter ones, but it's just- that last song, the, it's a- uh, It starts- Quiero ser uno contigo, mente y corazón, más de ti, you know me. Yeah, yeah, yeah that one, uh-huh. Yeah, so, that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. That, that yeah. Was fun. And actually on that one, I, I uh, ditched my pick and I just used my fingers. So I was playing the solo with just my fingers. Oh, yeah. yeah. I noticed that too. We just kind of went for a different sound on that song. So it was a lot of fun. We, we, we got to be creative on that album and just, just have fun. It was cool. So you also do a lot of finger style, um, I assume, because I, when I watched that video, I was like, wow, this guy's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I... I um. I, I like that sound. It, it gives the guitar a little bit different sound. And I was doing, um, I was also doing like thirds on the sixth and the third string. So, you know, I'm doing this whole action kind of up and down the fretboard. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, it was just, uh, just a different way to play it, you know. Um, but I do, I do like doing finger style. I actually studied classical guitar for a little while uh, along with my students. So I, I enjoy finger style. That's cool, David. And are you originally from uh, Dallas? Yeah, I actually grew up here. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. There's a guy here that wants to know, did you write many of those solos or did you coll collaborate with other people on the team? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think for the most part, I would usually write them myself and come up with them. Um, trying to think. Now, I will say, like, sometimes you'll hear different lines on, uh, I think, Cree Todo Es Posible in particular, that song has a lot of, like, uh, melodic lines, and Julian would write those, and then we'd all play them together. So, but as far as the solos, I normally would write them. Okay, gotcha. So, uh, you, you, you last time, I think, on uh, Messenger, you told me that you kind of, laid out a foundation for your solos and then kind of improvised a little bit on the moment is that how, how you did the entire album yeah that's pretty much always been my style um that i'll i'll get an idea i'll get kind of the basic melody down that i want to do mm -hmm. and then um and then improvise a little bit towards the end i, I always had a hard time um like making myself just do one thing the same way every time <laughs> so yeah. i love to i love to improvise and just kind of feel it in the moment but usually i'll, I'll give myself uh like a basic melody that i'm working around you know um, there's some exceptions i can't think i can't oh like uh amado salvador the first song on the album um i pretty much that was pretty much already written completely uh when we recorded it Oh, okay, gotcha. I see. Uh, I also noticed that on that album, you guys played uh, maybe a couple more songs than there are actually in the album, right? But I, I guess for some reason, you guys uh, didn't. Yeah, I don't remember, but we did play a lot of songs. So they may have cut some at the end. I don't know. Yeah. We but... did. We did. We redid some old songs, and there were some reprises, and yeah. Cool, man. And uh, if you decided to ever make, like, let's say, a tutorial for the entire album, would you uh, remember how to do all those solos? I'd Did have you... to listen. Yeah, I would have to listen to them again. And I actually have listened to some of them, and I and it, it is hard to remember exactly how I did everything. Um, it's been it's, it's been a while, but uh, I think I would remember most of them. Oh wow. If you had to narrow uh, your favorite three solos from that album, which one would they be? I know which one mine is. <laughs> well, I do. Yeah, I really like Amado Salvador. Um, and then um, Anelo Tu Presencia. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of my favorites. Um, and probably the one that you mentioned, the other fast one. Um, I can't think of it now. 
the the one with the, with the finger style. Um, I think it's called Quiero Ser Uno Contigo. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. I know I that. Think, I that one a lot. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. So, um, what about the other one, the Mi Universo? Do you remember anything from that solo? I, not really. I've listened to it a few times, <laughs> and and because uh, I I see people talk about it, and I've listened to it a few times, and and um, I always forget how it goes. I don't remember it honestly. <laughs> That has your name all over it, man. No matter where where you are, and you hear that, it's like, yeah, I know who that guy is. <laughs> that's funny. That's a pretty song, though. Yeah, that's a very beautiful song. Um, about that solo, um, I know you were focusing on your guitar, but he also had a, a guy painting, right? Yeah, yeah. He's a he's a friend of mine, a uh, friend of ours. His name's Carlos Casares. Okay. Yeah. He's a very um, great artist. He he really is remarkable. He does really really neat work. Very very humble guy. So um, so yeah, they had him paint during that song, um, and uh, I can't remember exactly what it it was. Just something about like the the worship of heaven, I think. Um, you know, but uh, but yeah, that was really cool. That was interesting. I yeah. kind of, my wife, I think it may have something to do with like the universe and how we just don't understand God and how we don't understand the universe, you know? Yeah. I'm yeah. sure uh, a meaning behind it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know he, you know, they sometimes some of our friends would do a thing called, we always call it the prophetic painting, you know, mm -hmm. where, you know, like if you're kind of like prophetic worship, like you just play what you feel like the Lord puts in your heart to play, you know, and, so um, he, I think, got an image that he felt led to, to paint. Um, if I remember correctly, it, wa it was something about, like, heaven joining in with our worship or the saints, you know, in heaven. Um, so it was, it was pretty neat. That's cool. Cool. And um, was it exhausting? Um, I don't know how you're doing on time. Are you, are you still good? Yeah, I'm fine. How was that experience, you know, when you actually toured with Marco, especially the Peru, was that exhausting? Were you tired? Did you feel like you want to do it again? Or were you like, I'm done with this? No, well, um, I, I I toured a lot when I was single. Uh, oh. So when you're single and you don't have a wife and you don't have a because you just, you go for it and and it's a lot of fun. It can be exhausting for sure. Uh, when we would go to places like Peru, I mean, you know, they're longer flights and uh, you're there for 10 days usually. Actually, I think that time we were only there for four or five days, but it's kind of like nonstop, like conferences all day and, uh, you know, doing different things. So it can be tiring, but it's a lot of fun. I, I've always enjoyed traveling. I really enjoy meeting new people um getting to talk with people and pray with people and just getting to know you know other believers in other parts of the world so i've always enjoyed that a lot i i love to travel and and just be with god's people and so but yeah. now having kids and a wife it would be pretty hard <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i don't know how marco does it you know i mean Normally, normally he would, what he usually does is he'll go out on a Friday or Saturday and come back on a Sunday. So it's usually a pretty quick trip. Um, that's a little more doable, but whenever you're doing international, uh, you know, that's, it can be taxing. How was your Spanish back then? <laughs> it wasn't very good. Um, I was able to understand Marco, like, okay. Marco speaks very slowly and very articulate. He's very easy to understand. So I could understand him pretty well, but um, but if it's like somebody from Venezuela or something, <laughs> so, like they talk really fast and it's just I different. Like, <laughs> huh? They're very fast spoken. Like they would say, instead of saying, David, como estas? They'll be like, David, como tu estas? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very exactly. fast. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but now back then it wasn't very good. And uh, Yvonne would help me a little bit, you know, but that's, um, 
But I really learned to speak Spanish better whenever I started leading worship at my church in Spanish. I was kind of forced to learn a lot more. And then uh, we would, my church, being that it is 70, 80% Hispanic, we do a lot of mission work in Mexico. Okay. Um, and so like traveling a lot more and then living in Mexico really helped a lot. When you say uh, you lead at church, you mean you play or you sing also? I couldn't hear you. Sorry. When you say you lead at church, that means that you sing also, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll lead like every, maybe every eight weeks or so at our church. And uh, I play guitar almost every week. Um, but, and we have a prayer service at our church that I lead at once a month. So. Okay. And um, I've seen a, a couple of videos where you were sing, uh, playing with, uh, I think his name is Klaus. And uh, side by side with Justin Luz. I don't know if that was your church or some other church. Oh, um, that was also at Christ for the Nations. So we used to play, oh. just used to play together with a, a friend of ours named Klaus. And he was actually one of the worship leaders at Steve and I. He used to play piano for Marco. And uh, he's an awesome guy as well. So we used to play together with him. That was a lot of fun. Justin's a really good guitar player. Let me, if you don't mind, it's kind of embarrassing. My phone is going to die. I don't, I'd hate for it to die in the middle of our thing. Let me grab a charger really quick. No problem, man. You're not too much into the whole ambient type of uh, tone, right? I, I see. I hear that you have a more um, traditional uh, kind of rockish style. You know, yeah, more, more defined. Yeah, um, yeah. I've never gotten real big into like uh, all the effects and stuff. Um, I mean, it's cool, and I enjoy playing it sometimes, but. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I guess for me, like it does, it almost feels like you can kind of lose your personality a little bit. And all <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It's a good um, thing you say that. <laughs> huh? It's a good thing you say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I've, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't want to sound negative at all. At all. I think it's a really cool sound, mm -hmm. but and I remember when it first came out, I, you know, I thought it was really amazing. I was very impressed with it. But I've always been a little bit bummed when, like, everybody's doing the same thing. So yeah. I'm just not big on that. I, I don't have any problem with any style or anything that anybody does. I, I think it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, but I just – I've always been real big. You know, something I was real big on with my students is, you know, I'd say just – learn how to express yourself to the Lord. Because I think that's what's worship. Like, I was reading something. I mean, I was I was reading the Word a few weeks ago, and I had been praying, like, for the last few months and asking God, like, there were some things that were kind of bothering me in my heart about just certain elements of, like, modern worship. Mm -hmm. And I won't get into them because I'm not one to, like, I don't want to be nitpicky. You know, I have to be really careful. You don't want to be nitpicky. You don't want to be yeah. religious. But I was really praying because I was like, you know, Lord, there's some things that are kind of bothering me. And I wasn't sure what to think about it. And I didn't want to be like, you know, it just be me. So I was reading and trying to see if there was something in the word that would help me understand and I came across the story where uh, King David, you know, is um, bringing the Ark of the Covenant, you know, the presence of the Lord back to Jerusalem. And he's going to offer a sacrifice there at the house of obed uh, where, you know, the angel had, had originally stopped the plague. And, um, and we all know the part where, uh, you know, obed says, you know, here you go. Here's all the all the cattle. Here's you know all the wood to offer the sacrifice and everything. And he says, you know, I'm not, I won't offer to God that which costs me nothing. And we all know that part of the verse, but because it gets quoted a lot. But the first part of the verse that I had not really paid attention to, and that I never hear anybody talk about, is he also says, 
I will not offer to God what is yours mm. or what's not mine. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a kind of what we yeah. end up doing in worship a lot of times nowadays is we're kind of like offering to God like somebody else's thing. And like that was their yeah. thing, but let it be their thing. And then you figure out your thing. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think that we've kind of lost a lot um, of the organicness of worship. And I'll be honest, I think multi-tracks is a big part of that. I think there's a little bit of a, a issue there. Um, and because, because like, uh, you know, if you play with multi-tracks, you're kind of like confined to play like exactly what that other person played. Yeah. I don't know. I personally, I'm just not real big on that. I, I, we use them at our church a little bit, but we're actually getting away from them. Um, we found that it actually has hampered our growth instead of helping our growth. So it's, it's funny how that works. But, um, but anyway, I'm, I'm just, I think that we all need to explore, you know, and, and really, really, I think that God gives you your own specific sound, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I can play all those other sounds, but, but I also like to, to be creative and, and find my own sound and, and try to express that to the Lord and then whatever he puts in my heart, you know? So I'm real big on that. Yeah, I definitely understand you. Uh, I think we tried multi-tracks when I, uh, maybe two, three years ago and, I wasn't very fond of it because um, I think, like you said, it takes so much of your own essence away. Yeah. That it's like you're just, you know, bringing someone else's offering to God instead of your own, you know? Yeah. And you don't realize that you're doing that. And it's yeah. not like everybody has bad intentions. But I, I think that there are often unintended consequences to using technology. Yeah, yeah. You know, even social media has kind of unintended consequences. You know, yeah. you just have to be careful yeah. and know what it is that you're doing. Yeah, I I, I agree 100%. Um, I think one of my main issues with uh, multi-tracks was that it made me feel like I was a robot when I was up there playing, you know. When, I, when I'm used to feeling free, you mm -hmm. know, and just going with the flow... <laughs> I yeah. think that was my main issue with it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, it's multi-tracks make you sound great. They make you sound very professional. But at the end of the day, like, is that the most important thing? Yeah. I don't know. And sometimes, you know, some churches use it. Our church used it a lot to kind of fill gaps mm -hmm. for a while because we didn't have very many musicians. Um, and so In we Texas? Were <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Yeah, but but uh, we were using it to fill gaps, you know. But we've kind of gotten away from that, so we don't yeah. need it as much anymore. But I still I still prefer a guy with his acoustic guitar. Yeah, know, definitely. Because there there's a little bit more liberty there. Yeah. And so it's a di huge difference, I think, when you're playing, you know, in a church. Uh, I think you have to let it let the spirit flow. I think you have to feel more free mm -hmm. than when you're playing in a, in a worldly setting or a yeah. scenario, you know, you have to be, you know, on point on everything that the original album has. Whereas yeah. in, when you're in worship uh, uh, time, I think you have to definitely let the spirit guide, you know, your music, your expression. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really important. Um, I think we have to be led by the spirit in, in everything that we do, you know, because if you can everything, then you're just going to miss it. You know, what if God wants to move a certain way? And it's not that he can't with multi-tracks because I've, we've seen yeah. him. You know, he does, but we just, but it, it just lends itself to, you know, canning it and it can even inhibit your growth as a musician because you just, it's easy to learn parts, especially with, like with multi-tracks nowadays. Hey, learn this part. I mean, they're all super easy. Yeah. Uh, but it kind of, I feel like 
it can help you be a better musician to a point and then it kind of stops and then it won't yeah. help. Or <laughs> you have yeah. to, you gotta yeah. gotta take the training wheels off so you can keep going. Yeah. You know? It kind of stumps your creativity also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and one thing too, and I think this is really important, really valuable just from a musical standpoint is like one of the most important things you, one of the most important skills you can have as a musician is knowing how to play in different size groups. Yeah. So for example, if you're playing in a three piece band with a guitar, drums and bass, you're going to play completely different than if yeah. you're Israel Houghton and there's like horns and two keyboards and three guitars and, <laughs> and stuff. you know, you have to play less. And yeah. so, um, but it's important to know how to fill those gaps if you're a small band. Uh, and it helps you be a better musician to yeah. be able to adapt to whatever size band you're playing in. Whereas in multi-tracks, it's, uh, again, there's nothing wrong with multi-tracks and I, I'm not, you know, like I'm not, I would never argue with somebody about like that. It's just, yeah. we're just talk, making some points, but, um, but you know, it does kind of, uh, you're always just learning those parts and learning how to play a part instead of like, playing with other musicians and playing as part of the group and learning how to like using your own creativity to know how to um, play what's appropriate, you know, yeah. um, it really, it really takes a lot of the thought process out of it. You know, you, you yeah. just learn the basic mechanics, but not really understanding how, um, not understanding how the recipe was made. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely, man. So. Yeah. When it comes to gear, um, you said you don't really get too much into it, right? But like, do you kind of remember uh, what type of gear you use for that album? Credo es posible? Yeah. So I've always had a very simple setup. Um, back then, I uh, I used the twin reverb, and then I had that other uh, tube amp that I used. It's a one channel amp, so it had a little bit of distortion, or I could turn the fuzz all the way up. And then um, what was that I, amp called? Sorry. Yeah, it's called Ampeg Jet 2. Jet 2. Do you still own yeah. that? No, I sold it several years oh, okay. ago. Yeah. Um, but uh, so back then, let's see, I, I, I had a very similar setup of what I have now. Uh, I used a DD20 Giga Delay. Uh, I used to use a Proco Rat. Oh, like, wow. I think it was a 1986 Proco Rat. And then um, I used a Tube Screamer. The TSO 808 mod. Uh, the I used the 535Q Crybaby Wah. Uh, back then, the compressor I had was a MXR Dynacomp. Okay. Which I don't really like. I wouldn't really recommend it. Um, I love my compressor now. But what is it? Then what else did I use? That's actually it. So I only had two overdrives or two distortions back then. And you stacked them. I would stack them, yeah, for like a lot of those heavier solos or that sort of like 80s sound. <laughs> I would stack them. Um, now what I have, it's very similar. I have uh, the Giga Delay. I have the same wah. The compressor I use is, um, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just forgot. This is, that's crazy. <laughs> anyway. Is it the Cali 76? No, it's um oh it's a Wampler. It's the oh, Wampler okay. Ego Mini. Yeah. And it has a blend knob. So I set the compression really high. The sustain is very, very high, but I've just blend a little bit in. So it has oh, okay. a very natural com sound, but it the sustain is really nice. So that's a that's a blue one, right? Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. And it's a super small pedal and it actually goes on the underside of my um my Temple Audio pedal board. Oh, so you always have it on? I just always have it on. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's such a nice compressor. It's very, very natural compared to the Dynacomp. And it was like $100 or something. Yeah, yeah. And then I also have, um, now I use a, a Tube Screamer amp. So I have the TS-15. It's a, it's a head and a speaker. So it's, um, you know, it's a class, I guess, class B uh, tube amplifier but it's really cool and then I have um, 
I got a new pedal from JHS. It's the Kilt version two. Oh, yeah, yeah. One that's 2G designed. Yeah. That's cool, cool pedal. I always wondered how he got a lot of the tones that he did. And it's super versatile, but amazing, like, semi-clean sounds and then amazing fuzz sounds. Such a cool pedal. Um, and then the other one I use is also a Wampler Overdrive, the, um, the Brad Paisley. Overdrive. Oh, yeah. So I like that one a lot. It's pretty versatile as well. Um, so I use all those different overdrives for different things. And are, you, a, are you more into like um, low to medium gain or do you ever reach into like high gain territory? Uh, I'm more low to medium, except I do like just for solo specifically, I'll, I like a little bit higher gain. Um, and then sometimes I'll use high gain just for like really big chords, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. just like low to medium gain with the delay, you know, to really fill it out and everything. Yeah. So, but if we're playing like Baroque or something, sometimes I'll have like more heavy gain. <laughs> I think somebody's asking, can multi-tracks be transposed? Yeah, you can transpose them to almost any key. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you download them from multitracks.com, you can transpose up and down. So, okay. Do you ever have to create multitracks for your uh, for your church? No, we never have. Um, that's it's something I've thought about doing before, but but we never have. But we're really we're really trying to to get away from that so our band can grow. We have a lot of young musicians in our at our church. Okay. And so we're trying to, we have to do a lot of like training and helping them, you know, to grow. Yeah. So. I saw that you, uh, on that album, you used uh, two Fender guitars. One was a Strat and the other one was a Tele, right? Yeah. Do you still own those guitars? Yeah, I do. Um, in fact, the Tele is right in front of me. <laughs> in the corner. Um, it's in a case, but. Uh, and then the Strat. I still have it, but it's actually um, in a couple different pieces. I, I got here, I'll show you. This one on the wall here um, is a, one that I picked up at a pawn shop, but I changed out to pick up and uh, I changed out a lot of things. But the neck on this guitar is actually the neck from that old, that other Strat. Um, so it's a 1988 Strat. So I've, I've got it on this guitar right now and I, I've got one neck that I need to refret so it's and uh and the body from that guitar from the album what did you do with it uh it's in the, it's in the case oh okay okay actually right there <laughs> i thought you had disposed of it man <laughs> no 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 it's just that i need to refret one of my necks and so i've got that one put away it has a very different pickup uh configuration and i wanted to try this one out and i really have liked it somebody gave me this um hot rails pickup it's an oh, old yeah. And it's really nice for the bridge. So I've been enjoying... It's a humbucker, right? Yeah. I've been enjoying that pickup configuration a lot. So I just haven't messed with the other one. Okay. And the uh, Tele, that was an American Deluxe, wasn't it? Actually, no. It's funny. A friend of mine, used he used to be my guitar tech. Um, and he uh, built that guitar for a customer. And the customer never paid him for it. And oh, never okay. up, so he gave it to me one year. <laughs> wow, man, that yeah. was a true blessing. <laughs> yeah, so it's actually a Japanese neck. It's a Schecter body. Oh, you know, wow. Schecter, back in the day, they they made tele copies. So it's like a 1965 reissue Schecter copy, and so it's just kind of a mutt, but I like it. It sounds pretty good. Yeah, I think that's the guitar they use on the first song, also the Amado Salvador, right? Yeah. Yeah, it has a, a cool sound, nice and thick. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you you modify a lot, right? Uh, guitars. Do you build guitars also? I used to. I had my own shop for a while, for a few years before we moved to Mexico. Um, when I, we moved to Mexico, I, I sold every – well, not everything, but I sold most of my shop and just kind of, like, gave up that career, um, got away from it, so – I don't really do it anymore. And uh, how did you learn that? 
So I actually, when I was single, I saved up and went to a school up in Michigan. There's a Luthery school um, that teaches guitar building and repair up in Michigan. And it's one of the best schools in the world for that. So um, I did a program up there. It's a lot of fun, actually. I would highly recommend it if anybody is ever looking into um, doing guitar repair because uh, they really teach you a lot of good things that you, you typically don't learn other places. And you actually build guitars from scratch. This is a really cool school. It was a lot of fun. Cool, man. Do, do you ever um, get anybody that comes up to you and say, hey, man, can you uh, modify a guitar for me or change something else? Yeah, I still get requests like for repairs and setups and different things, but I just I don't really have time for it anymore, unfortunately, um, because of our business and stuff. It's pretty demanding. And then, you know, have it, I've got little kids and so oh, wow. uh, we stay busy. We stay busy at church, you know, yeah. so. I would like to do it, but unfortunately right now I'm not able to. So you only work on your own stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, your family, I, I think I saw a picture of your wife. She's Hispanic, right? Yeah, she's Hispanic. Did she um, teach you any more Spanish? <laughs> Actually, not really. Well, she grew up in Dallas. She is Hispanic, but she grew up in Dallas. And okay. uh, she... Uh, She's actually less confident in her Spanish than I am. Oh, wow, man. <laughs> she can understand it better, but she's never actually spoken very much. Oh, so, okay, gotcha. But she can understand it perfectly because her grandparents, you know, they all spoke Spanish, so. Gotcha. How many children do you have? We have two. We have a five-year-old girl and a two-year-old boy. Okay. Yeah. How many kids do you have? We only have one. Cool. Yeah, he's uh, 13, so he's at that age where, you know, everything is a little bit interesting. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. yeah, kids are different nowadays, but he's a good kid overall. He's actually yeah. doing online school because my yeah. wife didn't want to send him with this yeah. whole COVID-19 thing. How are you yeah. guys holding up over there? Good, good. Uh, my wife and I have both had COVID, and thankfully it wasn't too bad. Okay. But um, I got sick back in May. I was down for about almost 14 days, um, and it really does, it can zap the life oh, really? out of me. But I didn't have any respiratory issues. I was just very tired and super achy. My whole mm -hmm. body hurt, um, so it was it was hard. My wife had a very mild case recently, mm -hmm. and thankfully hers, hers was not a big deal. So. Okay. But yeah, it's tricky. Yeah, yeah, I hear it. Uh, different people having different symptoms, yeah. different results. You know, some people just get horrible sick, and some people don't even yeah. feel it. Yeah, I had we had a couple of friends at church that got sick around the same time I did, and we don't I don't know who the original donor was, but uh, but they they got sick even worse than I did, so it was mm -hmm. hard. But then my pastor got sick recently, and he's like seventy four, and he. It was hardly anything for him, thankfully. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think my uh, pastor's mother also had it, and she's like 85, and she said she never felt any different. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Crazy. Yeah, dude. So uh, when it comes to um, – I, I remember asking you about uh, your experience with uh, Justin Blues. Have you ever performed with any other professional musicians? Um, no. Besides, besides Marco, besides Justin, you know. Yeah, I mean, obviously Keith, you know, Keith Banks plays with Marco, and so we would play mm -hmm. together, and, um, you know, pretty much just Marco's band, and then I traveled with Klaus for a while, but uh, no, I think that's pretty much it. I, I'm trying to remember. I filled in for a couple of other people here and there. Mm -hmm. Um actually got to play with uh, Mia San Marcos a few weeks ago here in Garland. In oh, Austin. really? They came to, I guess they live in Fort Worth now, which is close to Dallas. And they okay. came over to a church uh, here recently. It was actually kind of a small event, um, but it was neat. Uh, so I learned a lot of their parts and played with them. They're really cool guys. So that was pretty fun. 
Did you need any time for a rehearsal with uh, Miel San Marcos, or did you oh. uh, improvise <laughs> everything? Well, I just I tried to learn as many songs as I could, you know. And then you and put the, your your own little piece of David in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I mean, their songs are pretty s simple, except for there's just a lot of like melody lines to mm. memorize. Mm. So um, so I tried to do my best, you know. But it was fun. Yeah. yeah. But, they approach you about this or no? Or... So what happened was I just one of the guys at our church happened to know the guy that was organizing the event. And I guess they asked for musicians to fill in some of the holes. And so a few of us just filled in like on keyboard, guitar and acoustic. And uh, so, um, so yeah, I, I just happened to, to know somebody. They, they just, we just kind of went through the church basically. That was just a one uh, night experience, or yeah. Okay, where was this yeah. in Texas, right? Yeah, close to Dallas. Have Have you uh, maintained any communication with Marco after the that uh, Creto es Posible album? Well, here and there, but I actually haven't talked to him in a few years. I haven't seen him in a few years, um, but we would we would see each other every now and then, you know. So, but how I, far? I, I still see Yvonne. Okay. How far away do you uh, live from uh, Marco, Yvonne, Keith, Julian? We're all within, I mean, we're all within about 45 minutes of each other, roughly, you know. Oh, okay. So that Dallas is pretty big. There's a lot of different suburbs around Dallas. So um, I think Marco, if he still lives in the same area, he lives like South Dallas. Keith lives way over North Dallas. <laughs> I think Yvonne. <laughs> Central Dallas, and yeah. I'm anyway. I'm east. So, uh, David, we're gonna wrap it up, and I'm just gonna ask you if uh, there's any advice that you would give uh, upcoming, you know, Christian musicians today, and uh, anything that you want to tell them, whether it's yeah. ritual or or related to gear, rehearsal. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, I will say. A couple of things, um, man, just honest, honestly put God first in your life and don't seek opportunities. Uh, seek God and he'll put you in the place where you need to be. Um, my pastor growing up would always say to me, um, he said, I never try to open doors for myself. I just, I just allow the Lord to do that. And I, I, I really took that to heart, tried to learn from his example and I found that the Lord always puts me where I need to be. But if you, you know, Jesus said, I only do what I see my father doing. And I speak the things that I have learned from him. Yeah. And you'll have God's blessing and God's power and anointing. If you follow God and, and go where he tells you to. But if you put yourself out there, then it's all just you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not God's grace anymore. You know, so so we just have to, you know, learn how to to be led by the spirit and and let God lead us. And um, and that's that usually looks very different from what we think it's going to look like. Honestly, you know, if you look at the life of David, uh, he's a great example where God gave him a promise when he was a young boy that he would be king one day. And he even had the anointing of kingship on his life from a very young age, but it took him, I want to say it was, I think it was 20 years before he was anointed king, but before he actually had the crown on his head, yeah. got the office. So like my pastor always says, seek the anointing and not the office, you know, and, and honor God wherever you are, yeah. be faithful. Um, I was reminded today about, you know, where Jesus said, um, be faithful. He who is faithful in the little things will also be faithful in much. And if you're faithful in the little things, then God will give you more. So, so uh, David, it's been, it's been a, a pleasure speaking with you, getting to know you better. And you are such a great musician. Uh, you have inspired so many of us to do better in music and in ministry. I just want to say thank you for your time, man. It's been an awesome. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. I'm I'm
glad to be an inspiration if I can be. So that's that's good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Friend, thank you for your time, and uh, I will not take any more of your time. I know you're busy. You're good. You're good. Well, my pleasure. So, um, so yeah, if anybody has any questions, feel free to you know send me a message on Instagram or Facebook. Um, I'll I'll try to monitor that the next couple of days. Um, YouTube. And, uh, I'm sorry. What is your YouTube channel name? Is it just David Elam? I think it's David J. Elam. David J. Okay. But, yeah, but I don't really have a lot on there. Um, okay. Yeah, so uh, the best place to reach me is probably through Facebook. Um, Crazy. Yeah. So. And Instagram, uh, this is your main account, right? You don't use the other one anymore? No, I don't use the guitar one anymore. That was for when I was repairing guitars. Okay, gotcha. That one. All right, my friend. Thank you for your time and blessings to you and your family, man. Thank you. Same to you. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, man. We'll do it again some other time. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to hear more about your musical journey and what you're doing these days. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. It's been an honor. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.